technical difficulties. Yeah. <laughs> I just figured you all had a lot to catch up on, so you wanted some extra time to talk, of course. Well, we're glad that you can be here today for worship. Sorry for the brief delay there, but we are all good now, particularly because I know some people were watching, particularly uh, Christine and Victor who aren't with us. As Victor's recovering from his surgery, we'll definitely be keeping Linda, Victor, and any others in our prayer that are struggling with health in our community, mainly recovery. Announcement-wise, next week is Backyard Ministry. So just to plan ahead, we have some bags to pack next week. If you can be sure to stay after worship next Sunday to help us with that, we always appreciate as many hands as possible. Tuesday, we continue our Bible study in Romans. We are still very much at the beginning of the book, but we are hitting interesting territory. So if you could join us on Tuesday, be glad to have you. And this Wednesday is the first of our dinner followed by worship evenings. We did a few of these last spring. We're continuing these again this year. This is a way for our community to join together with the Kids Club community. So if you can come out for dinner at 5.30, we'd love to have you. And if not, then worship begins at 6.15. It's a nice short break in the middle of your week to give you a little bit of boost uh, in your lives. So if you can join us for that, we'd love to have you there. And it'd be great if you could invite a friend. So that's what's happening this week at the church. Are there any other announcements this week? Yes, Bonnie. Wonderful. That's amazing. That is so nice to hear. One of them already went through. That is great. Yeah. Just in case you didn't know, our church is going to be having to replace the sanctuary roof before water pours in in our sanctuary and our buildings condemned. So as that is a necessary thing, we have been working to raise funds for that, as that does cost quite a significant amount of money. And our congregation is smaller, so we are aiming to pursue grants and other means. So just know that your session is on the top of this. And that's so great to hear that God's already providing what we need for that. Wonderful. Any other announcements? That one boosted my spirits, so we're good now. <laughs> Technical difficulties, grants. Of, it's, it's a whiplash for me up here. Seeing none, let us come together in prayer as we bring our hearts to focus upon God. Lord, I thank you that we could come together this day to worship you. I thank you for the blessings that we receive in our lives as we pursue you in our ministries as we pursue you in our individual lives. Help us to be neighbors. Help us to be a welcoming place. Help us to love one another as you love us. And may we stand in your presence this day. May we find your spirit here welcoming us together as we pursue you this morning, gathering in worship to feel your presence and declare your glory. I see these things in your holy name. Amen. Would you please stand and join me in singing our first song, Jesus Shall Reign, number 30 in your hymnal. shall read. Voices shine. 
Knowing that we come before a God who loves us, who's here for us, who reigns in our hearts, let us come to pray together this prayer of confession for us this morning, which guides us into the heart of these scriptures, recognizing all that God does for us and what we can do for God in the world around us. Let us pray. Lord our God, you see us with eyes of compassion and love, choosing to walk among us and inviting us to your table. Thank you, Lord, for loving us despite all our faults and issues. You offer us your helping hand, even while we are still sinners. Help us to love our neighbors with the same love that you extend toward us. Help us to have compassion for our neighbors, extending mercy and not judgment. Lord, help us to see our neighbors through your eyes. Help us to put aside our agendas and live as Christ in the world around us. May we be a church of welcome for all, a place for the rich and the poor, the saint and the sinner, so that your grace and mercy would change the hearts of all whom we meet in our lives. Amen. We do come to a God who is here for us in our lives, who gives us mercy so that we might show mercy. And we come to God, having fallen short at times, and seeking his help in all that we do. And so we come in prayer, most of all. This week, we continue again to sing together this powerful song, Don't Stop Praying. Maybe you're familiar with it. We have done it quite a few times. So would you please join in singing with me today? What's your impossible, your I need a miracle? <clears throat> Must not you live in hanging by a single thread? What looks so hopeless now? What weighs down your heart with doubt? You beg for a breakthrough, but no sign of breakthrough yet. You cry and you cry till your tears run dry. The answer won't come and you don't know why. And you wonder if you can bow your head even one more time. Don't stop praying. Don't stop calling on Jesus' name. Keep on pounding on heaven's door. Let your knees wear out the floor. Don't stop believing. Cause mountains move with just a little faith. And your father's heard every single word you're saying. So don't stop praying. He's close to the brokenhearted. Saves those who are crushed in spirit. The Alpha and Omega knows how your story ends. When you cried and you cried till your tears run dry and the answer won't come and you don't know why. And you wonder if you can bow your head even one more time. Oh, do it one more time and don't stop praying. Don't stop calling on Jesus' name. Keep on pounding on heaven's door. Let your knees wear out the floor. Don't stop believing. Cause mountains move with just a little pain. And your father's heard every single word you're saying. So don't stop praying. Don't stop praying. Don't stop praying for the prodigal. Don't stop praying for the miracle. Hallelujah, hallelujah, and amen. Don't stop praying that addictions end. Don't stop praying for deliverance. Hallelujah, hallelujah, and amen. Don't stop praying for the sickness healed. Don't stop praying for his power revealed. Hallelujah, hallelujah, and amen. Don't stop praying for the kingdom's come. Don't stop praying that his will be done. Hallelujah, hallelujah, and amen. Don't stop praying. Don't stop calling on Jesus' name. Keep on pounding on heaven's door. Let your knees wear out the floor. Don't stop believing. Cause mountains move with just a little faith. And 
your father's heard every single word you're saying so don't stop praying don't stop praying don't you give up now no don't stop praying you may be seated and as we do come into our time of prayer for the many things in our congregation. We will be praying for Linda and Victor and Sherry Tiganelli. Are there any other prayers and concerns, and Jackson, are there any prayers and concerns to be shared this morning? All right. Well, there is plenty for us to pray for already there. So let us come together in prayer. Holy and gracious Lord, we gather this day to stand in your presence as we've already prayed earlier. We come to take a moment in our lives to remind ourselves of you amidst this world, to stand together and know you are near, to worship and proclaim truths that we hold dear, to remind ourselves of these things so that way when we might leave today, we would feel strengthened and we might be able to serve and follow you as best we can in our lives. And although we might stumble and fall short, we know that you will pick us up. And we don't stand in our perfection, but in your mercy. In the life of Jesus Christ, who sanctifies and strengthens and lives inside us, guiding us. Remind us of this, that you are the one that will right the wrongs, that you are the one whose kingdom we seek. Give us eyes to see the world as you do, Lord, then. Eyes of mercy, eyes of love, seeking the lost and our neighbor. We pray for your church that you placed in this world. We pray that you would renew us, that we would seek those who are lost, to be there for those who are wounded. For this day, we do pray that in all corners of this world, Lord, we might be able to uphold you better, that we would be a people and community who care they can come together all the more instead of divide to be a people who seek simply after you and follow in your steps as best and faithfully as we can and extend a hand to those who have none. Let us have discernment. Let us have faith, yes, but let us be a people of action, people that pray fervently and expect things to be done, a people that stand up and walk and invite and care and love for each other and for those who we may not have met yet. We pray this day, Lord, for your community here, that you would bless our families and our friends and our neighbors. We pray for the stranger in our midst. We pray for those who aren't able to be with us this morning, for there are many in our community who are not here today. We pray that they might join us online, and if not, let them know that they are in our prayers that they join us together through you, Lord, who unites us all together, that you are the fabric of our being and our identity. We pray for blessings on all those. And we pray all the more for those who are suffering, those who are sick, those who sorrow, that your spirit would bring comfort, that you would bring healing and care and love. We pray for the many names on our prayer list. We pray particularly today for those who we know have had recent surgeries, Linda and Victor and Jackson. We pray for those who are struggling with strength and the ability to even rise from their beds, like Sherry Tiganelli, and many more that we know in our lives. So in this moment, Lord, we lift up to you those things that weigh in our hearts. We lift up to you those things that we need your grace and your mercy for, Lord, that we might be able to stand in your presence and have a taste of your glory. Lord, all these things we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
Well, I'd say, could the kids come forward? But they're already forward. We only have a few today. That's OK. Mm -hmm. It's OK. You hear from me all the time at home. You can hear from me here now, too. It works out OK. I'm sure you don't get bored of it. You hear of me every single day? Every single Sunday, that's true. I don't always preach. I don't always preach to you at home. Maybe once in a while. Yeah. You're always with you. You're always with you. Yeah, that is true. So I have a question for you. Which one of you is my favorite? Neither. Good answer. Neither. Now, who here in this room do you think is God's favorite? Everyone. Everyone. Also a good answer. Now, when you're at school and you're playing with friends, do you sometimes have a favorite? Maybe. And sometimes as adults, we tend to have favorites or we're partial to hanging out with some people versus others. Now, that's OK. We're allowed to have friends, and God doesn't frown on us interacting with people that like us. And sometimes you like playing with blocks, and the other kid likes playing with sand. And that's OK. But I have a question for you. When it comes to being nice to people or sharing with them or being kind to them, do you think you should be favorites? No? Do you think it should be nice to everybody? Yeah. yeah. See, you kind of make sense to you. And kids are often pretty good at this, even if they get it wrong here once in a while. But guess what? Adults are horrible at this. It's weird. But I think you guys can maybe do a bit better job than us, because that's what God wants. And that's what James is writing about in his book. He's, he's telling us today in scriptures that we're not supposed to be favorites to who comes into our church and who we talk to as our neighbors. That no matter who they are or where they've been, we're to try to be as kind to them as we can. Now, that can be hard for some, and we're still supposed to make sure people aren't misbehaving, but we're to be, have kindness for every person that we can. That makes sense? And why do you think we should be kind? So the other person doesn't feel left out. So the other person doesn't feel left out, and because God's already been kind to us, right? So we have enough to share with others. But we said we want to be kind to other people. Exactly, because God's been nice to us. Want to pray? Dear God, help me be kind to all my neighbors. Amen. All right. I'll let you take these back. Talk to Mom about where you'll be going. days I lose the fight, try my best but I just don't get it right. Where well, I talk, I talk, but I don't walk and miss the moments right before my eye. Somebody with a hurt that I could have helped. Somebody with a hand that I could have held. When I just can't get past myself, Lord, help me be a little more like mercy, a little more like grace, a little more like kindness, goodness, love, and faith, a little more like patience, a little more like peace. A little more like Jesus, a little less like me. Yeah, there's no denying I've changed. I've been saved from who I used to be. But even at my best, I must confess, I still need help to be the way you see. Somebody with a hurt that I could have helped, somebody with a hand that I could have held. When I just can't get past myself, Lord, help me be a little more like mercy, a little more like grace. A little more like kindness, goodness, love, and faith. A little more like patience, 
a little more like peace, a little more like Jesus, a little less like me. Oh, to feed the beggar on the street, love to be your hands and feet, freely give what I receive, Lord, help me be. I want to put you first above all else, love my neighbor as myself. In the moments no one sees, Lord, help me be. A little more like mercy, a little more like grace, a little more like kindness, goodness, love, and faith. A little more like patience, a little more like peace, a little more like Jesus, oh, a little less like me. A little more like living everything I preach, a little more like Jesus. Us, a little less like me. Oh, a little less like me. We gather today around scriptures. We have reached the second chapter of James. So let us read now together these verses 1 through 13. I would encourage you to open your own Bibles if you have them. My brothers and sisters, do not claim the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ of glory while showing partiality. For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here in a good place, please. Now to the other one who is poor, you say, stand there or sit by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor person. And is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into the courts? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For the one who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. This is the word of the Lord for us this day. Would you join me in a moment of prayer? Lord, may the meditations of our hearts and the words that I speak this day be glorifying to you. I pray that your spirit would come upon each of us to help us learn how to better follow you in our lives. We ask these things in your name. Amen. We are going back to basics. And I'll keep reiterating this point every week to help remind us because Basics are the things that we can more tangibly hold on to in some ways in our lives. And in this world full of lots of thoughts, this world full of ways to live and things to do, basics is good to have. Because they're the things that you can practice, right? Sometimes this Christian thing can get a little out of hand in theology, and you wonder, well, how am I supposed to be and do? And so James is a wonderful book to tell us how to do things. And this week is another practical lesson for us. How are we to live without what I'll call favoritism? Because James is starting to begin to speak more specifically. He set up in that first chapter the fact that we're to live lives of faith. 
live lives of faith, that as Christians we're called to begin to do things, that is for faith and action, that we're not to simply just come on Sunday morning or on one Bible study or in our homes reading one scripture a week and then do nothing else. Christians are meant to live and begin to live in Christ, the one who has been embedded in us, the Holy Spirit that gives us strength to change. And James is concerned with the church being the church. Not just in what it says it believes, but in what it does in the world. Particularly here in its relationship with the world, relationship with one another. And so he turns, as we open chapter 2, to his words on, as he phrases it, partiality. More easily to say favoritism in our modern language. It's a particular trap that is easy for all of us to fall into, is it not? We naturally have reactions to other people. That's going to happen. We tend to migrate and interact with people similar to us. It's generally how we form friends and groups. You like board games? Go play board games. You like movies? Well, maybe you go watch movies with people. You love to knit? Well, maybe you go in with a knitting group. Whatever it might be. And this is where we tend to go and be with people. It's not completely bad. The danger, though, the issue for us as Christians is when we begin to demarcate, to separate, to show partiality based upon these things of this world. And Jesus, James, is making this the easiest distinction, particularly in his setting, the one he's writing to, can be applied to us quite easily. In those first seven verses, he speaks about money. Not hard to do because that's an issue that pervades through all time and place, rich and poor. And it continues to grow and be a reality in our lives. For him, he gave that easy example of what happens when a poor person or a rich person comes into your assembly. How do you react? Where do you put them? Do you love the rich man more? Do you question the motives of the poor man? See, we have this tendency to show favoritism to those who have wealth. Some may alternatively show favoritism to those that don't. Some people in our society today might be like, well, we're going to actually appreciate the poor person more, and if you come in all put together, we'll just assume your life's OK. Or we'll judge you for being rich. Odd that it can still demarcate and separate based on wealth, but maybe in the opposite ways you expect. And both are still an issue. And this is just one example that James has given. He's not really saying this particular thing, just this splitting of rich and poor is his focus. It's just his example. We could find other ways in our lives. He's particularly addressing the church in Jerusalem. What about us today? What is it in your life? today. We must be careful to not draw distinctions based upon the designs, cultures, appearances, age, gender of the individuals around us. Too often we split up based upon these things, race, cleanliness, prior issues that they might have, politics, we got six weeks to an election. I wonder how easily we can split and not care for the person on the other side in these six weeks and following. It is the judgment based not on substance, but on appearance. Not on a person for who they are. Not on a person for who they're trying to be or could be in God's sight. And something we're all too easy to do in the world today. They shouldn't be allowed to do that because of this. We'll be happy they're here, sure, but they can sit in that part of the church. The church is meant to be a space of welcome for anyone who comes to our doors. 
I would argue as well that as a sent people, because let us not forget chapter 2 is still part of the whole of James, and James's focus is on its life in the world and being an active presence, then that following the trajectory, we are to be a people living deeper into the life of Christ. So then how are we being Christ among all people? Not just those that come in our doors, but in our lives. And all the more, understand that sadly, in churches, in our lives, in the culture of the world today, we tend to veer toward judgment first. And that sadly is a breaking of that life of Christ within us. The one that James says is to begin to grow. And so we can more easily understand now how James goes from talking of this rich, this poor, this favoritism, to then discussing this matter of the law and mercy. Because within the law is a particular address, a summation, as it were, to love your neighbor. If you remember, Jesus Christ himself did this. When he asked what's the most important law, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. They're summations. And so the swing James takes is to help us understand maybe why we shouldn't show favoritism and methods by which we should encourage ourselves or push ourselves to do that. There's a connection to the law that he gives, as I just said, this Old Testament theme that appears over and over again. But it's not just the Old Testament per se. James isn't saying, hey, uphold all the Old Testament laws as presented, but understand them within light of who Jesus is, of how Jesus fulfilled them. But even without the Old Testament, even without those laws at our hands and tips that we actually just walked through in Exodus, we could just think about it in our own terms today. Because there's a common misconception, and I think James hits the nail on the head, of how we understand how we're to live our lives and this trap that we fall into when we look at ourselves and the world around us. And it's that we think the law is more of a balancing scale. You say, okay, in my balancing scale, I'm okay because I only do a little bit wrong. There's all these really bad things I could do and I don't do any of them, so I'm okay. It's all right if I just do some of these little things here and there. I know they're not quite what God would want me to do. I know it's not a perfect life, but at least I'm not murdering people. At least I'm not abusing people. At least I'm not outright stealing. But in reality, the issue is breaking of any of the law is still breaking the law. We might have certain things in our lives that we do. We might speed. Sure, just a little, little law break. Just a little law break. But technically, if you do it, you are still breaking the rules. Even if it's just a little bit. There's tiny things that we do. And the law of God within us, in Jesus Christ, shows us each and every day possible things. The way we talk, the way we speak, the way we act. And showing partiality, favoritism, in James's mind is just as bad as committing murder. For each is the same in the end when it comes to our relationship with God. Not in quality, yes, murder is far worse and will be judged worse, but in the fact that they are both sinful and wrong. Just because it's not as bad doesn't mean it's not still bad. It's following the words of Christ even, who told us that if you just hold anger in your heart, you've killed the man. Well, what is favoritism but not another form of judgment and anger? That's what James is talking about here. And it's an important lesson, I believe, for each of us in this world and how we relate to our neighbors. We're so caught up with playing comparison games, thinking of how we can show ourselves to be morally superior to the people around us. We are so caught up with thinking how we could be intellectually superior, knowing the best arguments, politically right, depending on which side you think is politically right, and saying the other one is 
just evil in its essence, or even religiously superior to others. We can escape judgment and feel satisfied in ourselves in this game that we play. Yet, the comparison falls short because the true comparison is between you and Jesus Christ. Now, maybe you're like me, and if you make that comparison, it's a little bit harder to say you're doing well. But we don't want to play that comparison. Let us judge others upon myself and their standing. I don't want to look upon my standing compared to Christ, Pastor. Because when I do that, I'm not going to find value or consolation or lasting satisfaction in that. My, my being compared to others is based upon how I can say I'm good. But here's the issue. When your value, when how good you think you're doing is based on others, you will never find satisfaction in it. When you begin to play the game of trying to say I'm morally superior to them or I'm intellectually superior to them, it will be a continual path you have to take that will never fulfill you. You will never reach the end of that journey. Someone else will always be more pretty. Someone else will always be smarter. Someone else will have the right politics or the ways they can live. And it's the hollow, never satisfying void of social media today in its darkest form. It's the trap that more and more of our youth fall into because that's how the world's operating. Should the church not be a bastion against that? In verse 12, James tells us, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. What he's saying is, you're liberated from the penalty of sin. In Jesus Christ, you have been saved. You've been brought out of your mud. You have a chance to be free and live. So now live it. You don't need to play your comparison games, and you don't need to play the comparison game with Christ because he's already given you what you need. This is the powerful truth. In your comparison to Christ, yes, you fall short. Yet God has liberated you from the burden of falling short, of the penalty of that sin, and now given you the very life that you find so holy, so good, so loving, and he's put it inside you so that now a you can live what you see. Standing in the knowledge, we turn to the key then of today. The thing I do want you to come away with most of all of this basic, simple tenant for us in how we counter favoritism, and it's mercy. That is the conclusion that James comes to here. In verse 13, he says, For judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And as a reminder, where we concluded last week in verse 27 of chapter 1, religion is pure and undefiled before God is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained in the world. See, we're called to a different way of interacting in the world. And if not because we want to, if not because of our desire to live as Christ, James puts one last caveat on it. He reminds us of a final reason, and that truly is a day of judgment that comes when our lives are laid out before God. Sometimes we need a kick in the butt and a reminder more than a pat on the back. That's kind of what James is providing here. Now, James is not saying that if we don't show mercy, that God will not have mercy on us. That, that isn't how this works. It isn't a method of making sure to be merciful so that way you can get mercy. That's a form of works, a form of trying to be saved by doing things. That's the opposite. That would be going back to our faulty method of understanding the law that we've discussed earlier. No, what James is concerned with is our lives showing evidence of mercy that's already been bestowed upon us in Christ. Evidence of the mercy already alive within us because of the mercy God has already shown upon us. Our merciful attitude and actions count as evidence of the presence of Christ within us. 
How do you judge if you're doing well? If you're living into the life that Christ has given you? Do you show mercy? Our lives of judgment, showing favoritism, forgetting the downtrodden, are, as James would put it, evidence of a life without Christ in it. Now, I do not believe James considered this to be a discussion of salvation. I don't want you to come away worrying about that. That's a different thing. To be overwhelmed by worry over this matter. But, but, James is concerned. And we should be concerned, just as Jesus was, as Paul was, with a weak way of living being unchanged by the grace that has been given to us, living lives the same way as we lived before. I'm continuing to use this analogy of a people that like to live in their mud instead of coming out of it. Well, if you still look like you're covered in mud, are you living the life? James is using such strong language and reminders of judgment because we sadly, as I said, don't respond to a sense of problems in our lives when it's just encouraged to do the right thing. Calls to care for others fall on deaf ears. The need for mercy and the care for others is drowned beneath the waves of judgment and vitriol and self-centeredness permeating our culture today. Sadly, at times, we need a wake-up call beyond, hey, behave better, friends. You really should. It's the right thing to do. You should be nice. Sadly, that approach tends to fall on deaf ears. Appeals of this nature fall short, even among Christians, because there is a bent towards sinfulness, not godliness, still alive too much in our lives. And even in our hearts, we all too often turn toward our desires our fallen human natures that lead us away from Christ. And so we turn sometimes to reminders that although we're justified in Christ, although our salvation is assured, not through works, that our lives will still be judged. And when you come before God, what do you want God to say about you? Well, I still see Christ alive in you, but you're still covered in mud. I'll forgive you, but you could have done a bit better at cleaning yourself up. So we turn to mercy. This is a deep and powerful truth because it's something that is altogether easy to receive, is it not? And it's something that's very hard to give. Mercy, just to define the word for you, is not getting what you do deserve. Not getting what you do deserve in the sense of, you deserve punishment. You've done wrong. You have done these things. And mercy is God saying, that's okay. I've paid the price for it, you don't have to. Not getting what you do deserve. And grace is getting what you don't deserve. Grace is God's pouring out of his love upon us even though we don't deserve it. So the question is, having received both grace and mercy from God, what are we doing in the world around us? How are we living our lives with our neighbors? What is the church in the midst of all this politics, in the midst of division, in the midst of strife, wars, and issues doing to be a people that act and look different? Or... Do we just look the same? What would James say to the church today? What would James say to you today? Mercy is something easy to get, and it is hard to give. Because I know, my friends, living in this world when others are not nice to us, living in this world that I've just described, full of its issues and its problems and the way we treat one another, means that I'm calling you to do the hard thing, to turn your cheek, to be there for someone who's been mean to you, 
and to love in a way that is a lot harder to be. Because the world isn't going to show mercy. It's not in our instincts. It means when someone cuts you off in line, take a breath. It means that when someone has been cruel to you, take a breath. It means that when you get in those arguments over politics and you begin to see only red, remember that the person across from you is also a human being. And that God cares for them to know of his love just as much as God cared to show you love. It is a difficult thing. And it is a basic thing. How much better would the world be if the church could show mercy all the better. And how many more people would actually want to be in a church if we did? Would you pray with me this day? Lord, I thank you that you are a God of mercy. I thank you that you love us and that you care for us. And that thankfully, as James put it, mercy triumphs over judgment. Because in the end, even when we fall short, you are a God who is able to show mercy beyond our strength. Because there will be times that we cannot do it. There will be times where we need to rely on you to do it. So we thank you, Lord, that you are a God who is big enough to do so, to the point of even dying on a cross for us. Thank you, Lord. As we gather together to take our offering today, I believe we have a video. Yes? Wonderful. Then with those who are able to do our offering, it's great to see Frankie back. Please come forward. Lord, may these offerings go to show your grace and mercy and love to the world around us. We ask these things in your holy name. Amen. And our final song is Be Thou My Vision, which is a good song for us as we go into the world and we look upon others, that we would see them and I see ourselves as Christ sees us. Would you sing with me? Be 
Go this week knowing that God's mercy is upon you and that in that mercy you have the power and strength to do things that you might not think you can. That in God's love and the strength of Jesus Christ, all things are possible. So go in the love of God the Father, the strength of Jesus Christ, and the presence of the Holy Spirit now and forevermore. Amen.